Let's open our Bibles. Let's do more than open our Bibles. Let's study this. Let's learn this. Let's live this, all right? We're studying the book of Acts, as you know, unless you're a visitor, and we want to... Uh, <clears throat> We want to really let this not just be a historical lesson and marvel at uh, some of the details of this biblical account, but I think that we, we need to bring home that which will encourage us in our Christian life to trust God with more, to understand that He is perfectly faithful. But I also want us to see that the Bible is real transparent about the struggles that these heroes of the faith, like the Apostle Paul, really had. They really endured some things. Last week, as we started this message, I, uh, I wanted to... That was the groundwork. I need you to understand, and I want to touch on that again, especially for those that weren't here, because we need to weave this together, but we want to finish this, this today. And so we're looking at... Serving our faithful God is what we're seeing this all about in Acts chapter 18 and verses 1 through 17. And we're, we're going to first note some, the context, the situation. I, I really hope you can get into the skin of the, of the person this is about. The author... Who's the author of this portion of God's word? Besides the Spirit of God, who's the human author? Luke, what was his occupation? He was a physician, a doctor. And he is a pretty good, the way he, uh, the way he writes, he's a, he's a good writer. He's, he's a accurate and he's very complete in his historical thing. And the Spirit of God, of course, is working with, with Dr. Luke to give us what we have here in this transitional book. <clears throat> Let me read to you. If you have your Bibles open, I'm, I'm going to read to you the first 17 verses of chapter 18, book of Acts, chapter 18, verses 1 through 17. Then we'll start, we'll give you a little bit of the, uh, we'll, we have some slides and we'll help to hopefully give you a feel for what this place was like where Paul's landing now as he's in this city called Corinth. Verse 1, after these things, he, this is Paul, left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife, Priscilla, because Claudius, the emperor at that time, had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. He came to them. Paul came to Aquila and Priscilla, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath <clears throat> and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when they had resisted and blasphemed, that is, the leaders of the synagogue, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then he left there and went to the house of a man named Titicus Justus a worshiper of God whose house was next to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. And the Lord said to Paul, in the night by a vision, do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And he settled there for a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, 
the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat, saying, This man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of right, a wrong or of a vicious crime, O Jews, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you. But if there are questions about words and names and your own law, look after it yourselves. I am unwilling to be a judge of these matters. And he drove them away from the judgment seat. They all took hold of Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and began beating him in front of the judgment seat. But Gallio was not concerned about any of these things. Let me first impress upon you the state of mind and emotion that the apostle was in at the time that this is written about. We read something about this in 1 Corinthians and in 1 Thessalonians, where Paul writes in those places about his time in Corinth, during which this that we've just read when it's taken place. You might think that a great saint like the Apostle Paul, that he didn't struggle, but he did. He used words like, we were distressed, we were afflicted, speaking about this time in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he uses these words about himself. He said that we were in weakness, we were in fear, much trembling. What in the world brought this man who had already demonstrated so much confidence in Christ, so brave to stand up in front time and time again in these synagogues and speak about Jesus in front of these synagogues throughout the Roman Empire. What in the world brought him to this place? Well, the, the reason I need to at least touch on some of that is because I know that I'm talking to a group of people that struggle at times with the same kind of things. We get fearful. We get distressed. Circumstances hurt us, bring us down. It might be not necessarily on us. If you really want to get some of us down, you'll, you'll let us watch our loved ones, the people closest to us, go through hard times. That'll get to you. So what is it that brought Paul into a state of distress and discouragement so that he needed some help from God? And that is our message is how do we keep serving God when we're in that state of heart and mind? And what do we need to know today about our God? How does he address people in that condition? That's the questions this passage of scripture is supposed to answer. Well, <clears throat> let me give you a little background. First of all, this slide does not represent what came before. Which uh, I get a little feedback. Which missionary journey are we on right now with Paul? This is second missionary journey. He left from Antioch, the home church. But what happened before he left Antioch and Syria? That was a hard thing. What was the what was the problem? Before Paul left Antioch this time. He and Barnabas. His partner in the, the first missionary commissioned out of this church. These were, the, these were the tight brothers. And they had a dispute that was strong. And they might have even had a little bit of defeat over the way this went. But this is how the second missionary journey began. Is Paul and Barnabas separating. Barnabas taking his relative John Mark and going off toward Crete. Paul striking off alone, going in, inland, not on the sea, and going up through Tarsus and up into the area that they had covered and visiting, revisiting the churches they had seen in the first missionary journey. But, I mean, that's how it started. And then after visiting those churches, then they break out into new territory and Paul tries to go into Asia Minor. And what does the Spirit of God say? No. Whoa, he wasn't used to that. And then he tried to go to another direction and go into Bithynia. And the Spirit of God said what? No. Not, and we don't know how that happened. If it was, it's not recorded. 
But it was clear. The scripture says that God said, Spirit of God said, you can't go there. You can't go there. So he keeps trying. And he goes over to the coastal city of Tarsus, of Tarsus and or not Tarsus, Troas. And what happened in Troas that put them on a ship and headed across the, the bay to go over to Philippi? What did he see in the night? He saw a vision. God spoke to him in a vision. A man said, come over and help us. And this was a Macedonian. That's the region. Up in, in this, this is a historic first. This is the first time the gospel of Christ goes into the continent of Europe. And he goes there with his team. He's, with, he's got Timothy. He's got Luke. He's got Silas. And they go to Philippi. And what a wonderful experience that was. <laughs> no, because that's where they were. Uh, Paul and Silas were beaten unjustly. Put into the maximum part, the hardest part of the prison in stocks. And the, you remember the story of the Philippian jailer and the earthquake and the guy about to kill himself and then no no don't do that we're all here and the philippian jailer gets saved and the, the the church of philippi is started with a jailer a businesswoman uh possibly with a a, a young lady that had been a demon possessed person misused by some controlling men for their business purposes and others but he couldn't stay after he was beaten the next morning, they tried to quietly have him leave town. He said, uh-uh, you just disobeyed Roman law. We are Roman citizens that have been beaten without a trial. You come yourselves and acknowledge what you've done wrong. Could have taken it further, but he didn't. But he did that in order to help the Philippian church not be oppressed any further. But, I mean, you see what's stacking up? This is the background. From Philippi, he goes through two little, little towns, but he makes his way over to the next big place we get a book named after. It's called Thessalonica. First and second Thessalonians was written to this place. How did it go in Thessalonica? Not good. Again, there were some Jewish leaders that rejected his message of Christ, the resurrected Christ. And he had to flee. He was only able to be there just a few weeks. And this is what really started bothering him is his concern for these new Christians. He cares for them. He wants to help them get grounded in Christ. And they've made it hard for him to go back. So he tells his traveling companions to stay or to go back to these places. And from, from there he goes to Berea. And that was a cool place because there the Bereans are the ones that searched the scriptures, right? To see if, if it was really true. They were scripture searchers. That's what we're supposed to be. And when things were starting to go good there, then who did Satan bring in to make that a problem? The, the Jews from Thessalonica hated him so much that they dogged him into Berea and he couldn't stay there any longer. So the saints, the Christians in, in Berea, not his traveling companions of Silas, Timothy, or Luke. Luke had states he was not even in the party at this point. Then he, I think he went by sea all the way down to Athens. And the Christians that escorted him down there left him alone in Athens. This is a, we talked about that a, a few Sundays back before Resurrection Day. Athens was a different kind of place. It was the seat of, of Greek thinking, and it was a secular place. And he had his opportunity to speak about Christ. And very few converts apparently came to Christ in that experience. But then he leaves there, and he goes to this place. Let me catch up. <clears throat> From Philippi to Thessalonica to Berea. Then down to Athens, and there he was left alone. And the traveling companions went back to Berea that had helped him get down there. And from Athens, 50 miles away, is Corinth. 
And you see that Achaia, that place, the, the region's name, Achaia, it's got this little land bridge that's only, the narrowest place is only five miles wide. And this made Corinth a strategically located city. Corinth had a population of about 200,000. And it was known for uh, commerce. A road went across that land bridge, but goods from the upper gulf came down and then they would unload the ships and bring them by, back through that area and put them onto ships that were going to go on on the gulf below it or vice versa. And so it was, a, it was a major commerce center, but you know what they were mostly known for? Corruption, immorality, perversion. Co Corinth was a sinful, sinful city. And I showed you this little video that high up above Corinth is basically down there close to sea level. But there's a mountain over a thousand feet tall. And they had built uh, a temple to Aphrodite. It was a, you combine sex and, uh, and, and religion and you have a real problem. But this place was called Acro Corinth or Upper Corinth. And this is the ruins of it. There's 50 miles that he made, made it to there. Here is a quick little flyover. You can see how high this place is. But even the ruins today, this was a fort that was highly defendable. But every night out of the temple of Aphrodite, a thousand religious devotees, prostitutes, worked their ways off of this upper area down to the visitors and the sailors and the businessmen and the citizens of Corinth. They would go down off of this mountain, walk down every night and do their thing in the city streets. And that was the place where Paul was alone with the gospel and fearing what was going to happen. I don't want to. I think you get the idea. So last week, now you kind of get an idea. I want you, do you feel it? You feel it? He's kind of, he's kind of vulnerable. He's not doing well. He's fearful according to what the Lord said there in that, when he came to him in that vision. If the Lord's going to come, that means Paul had to need that. That was about the only thing the grace of God could do to help him. That's how serious of a situation it was for him to be able to have the Lord's coming and giving him that message. And then to top it off, for the first time in his whole life as a missionary servant of God, he runs out of money. And he has to go to work. Now, there's not a problem with that. We have a lot of our church planters. I had to do it for a while. Bivocational is the fancy word we call it. You pastor a church, but you can't support your family yet. And so you go get a job and you give part of your life resources to the job for your family. And you give what's left over to the pastoring the church. And I'm so thankful for this church because after a year of doing that, the leaders came and said, that's enough of that. What do we need to come up with in order to make you leave those other people over there? And it wasn't another church. It was serving with construction and they and and ever since then we have by god's wonderful grace we have been full-time able to love you and serve you and teach you but paul was out of funds and he didn't mention it to anybody apparently he just he was a leather worker tent maker and so he the lord let him meet aquila and priscilla that's what their trade was and he got, he roomed with them and he helped them in the trade and he, and he was going on. So he had spiritual concerns. He had discouragement about how the last several places had been in his ministry. Every place he had constant opposition. He was dealing with loneliness, physical pain. He probably still had from the beatings that he had gotten in Philippi. And he was weary and now he's out of money. Where are you, God? Are you faithful? 
Maybe you're here today and you're going, boy, I kind of feel that one. So, how is God faithful toward his servants in that condition? Number one, we saw it last week. First of all, in verses one through four, it says that uh, he, he raised up godly co-workers. And we saw that <clears throat> when he met Aquila and Priscilla. And then later on in verse five, Silas and Timothy showed up. And when they showed up, they had money from one of the churches that he had not asked for, but they supported him. And he had enough to quit doing the tent and leather work stuff. And he could be full time serving the Lord, sharing the gospel in that sinful city. So the Lord knows your needs. He's, he's, he's faithful. He'll raise up. He'll, he'll encourage you when it's necessary. God does, really, God did not design it for us to go alone. One of, the, one of the things that I came to develop as a, as a standard in my ministry was that God doesn't like lone, lone ranger missionaries. I believe that teamwork is his is normal way. I believe that's one of the reasons why the local church is the way, because we need each other in a particular situation. And so the Lord designed us not to go it alone. We need each other. Team ministry is good. We need to complement one another. We need to be able to pray for one another. We need to be able to bear one another's burdens. My question for you is, are you humble enough to let somebody else bear your burdens? Number two. Now we're on new stuff. So number f in the fifth verse, <clears throat> God is faithful, number two, to provide funds for the work. Now, as I mentioned, Paul did not advertise his needs. He just went to work, and that's fine. That's a fine thing to do. That's, he was very willing to represent the needs of others. In 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, he knew about the needs of the saints in Jerusalem that were going through tr terrible persecution and they were, in they were in terrible poverty. And so he collected uh, amongst the Gentile churches that he had seen starting up in the Roman Empire. He collected up funds and then several guys carried those back at some point to Jerusalem. But when it came to him needing money, he just went to the Lord and said, Lord, I... I'm willing to go to work, and I'll support myself. But I don't, I, I, you know, money is a touchy subject. There's been so much abuse of this in our time, of people in spiritual responsibilities, pastors or other kind of people, they've, they've kind of fleeced the flock. We make it a habit here to not really talk about money. The Lord has always provided for this church. Always. And, he, and I believe he will. But all of us should, I think, no matter what our circumstances, whether we have a little or a lot, all of us should walk by faith. It's a joy to see the Lord come through when we need something that's truly a real need to see the Lord. And also it's a joy to be part of meeting someone else's need. That's just the Christian body life. That's very, very good. But the Lord, I, I, I wish I had taken better notes in a journal over the years. But as a missionary, I saw it again and again and again. Before we even knew of a need, sometimes the Lord would provide something and I'd go, well, $8,000, what are we going to do with this? And then the transmission went out. And then the engine went out. And guess what all that cost? $8,000. Costs were a little higher in West Virginia. Than... <laughs> but the Lord knows our needs. And he says, he writes to the church in Philippi, and he says in chapter 4, but my God shall, that's a promise, supply how much are your needs according to his riches? Oh. All your needs. My grandmother, the last time I saw her, blind and crippled, 
And as I went off to my second year of Bible college, not knowing that she would, I would not see her this side of heaven after that time, the last thing she said to me is, Tommy, let me give you my life verse. This is the promise the Lord will provide for you if you're in his will. And he has. And that was my verse, Philippians chapter 4. My God shall supply all your needs. But that verse was written to a church that was sacrificial in their giving. God supplies needs for people that trust him to be generous in the first place. Don't ever get that out of context. Thirdly, God is faithful to discouraged and fearful servants at any time in our life. And he's faithful to bring converts, fruits, those who trust Christ because of our sharing with them. Even when it's tough, when there's opposition. It says in verses 7 and 8, <clears throat> after he had separated from the synagogue people and he had said, you know, your blood be upon your own heads. I'm clean. I'm going to go now to the Gentiles. Said then he left there and went to the house of a man named Titicus Justus, worshiper of God, right next door to the synagogue. That had to be cool. You know, um, I love this about Kaysville Bible Church. The Lord provided a, a, a supreme facility. How many of you have ever visited that church? You, you know what we're talking about? Only the people in the very back row. What is that supposed to mean? <laughs> Kaysville, under Dr. Roy Short's ministry, uh, they, they, the Lord provided for them the finest facility in a prime corner in Kaysville. It's a wonderful thing. And another church could not stand that there was such a nice facility. So they bought the one right across the street on the adjoining corner and built a unique one of their kind of churches right there. I thought, well, that says something. That's pretty cool. But the, the, this, this guy right next to the synagogue opened up. That had to be an, a, a, from the Lord encouragement. How faithful for God to let that man right next to the synagogue, when those synagogue guys would go in each Sabbath and they look over there and they go, oh, he's right there. That's cool. I mean, I think God's got a little bit of a sense of humor. And it goes on to say of another guy, Crispus, he was the leader of the synagogue. He came to Christ. And so they lost their leader to, to, Christ, to Christ on that, that, that right there in the face of it. But here's what I really think is super encouraging. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. When we get to 1 Corinthians, <clears throat> Paul is writing now later about these people. And he talks about the makeup of the people in that church. What kind of people came to the Lord? It says at the end of chapter 18, verse uh, 8, And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, that is the gospel, were believing and being baptized. Well, that's all it says in our text, is that many of the Corinthians were heard. But what kind of people? In 1 Corinthians, when he writes back to them, he tells us more of what kind of people. And we go to verse 9. Chapter 6, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. And he says this. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals. And the words, those last two words lead us to understand that in the homosexual community, some are the more submissive in the male-male relationship. They're the more su subdued and submissive partner. And the other one is the more dominant partner. And he says, whichever in, in that relationship goes on, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor sw drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. But look at verse 11. Such were some of you. 
It's right into Corinth, and he says, we got in this church, we got, here is the kind of people we got in our church, former drug addicts, former drunkards, former fighters, former homosexuals, former adulterers. We've got, this is our makeup. But you notice the word were? See, God, here, listen to me now. God can change people. This is the message that the world does not want to hear, actually. They want to say, you're born this way. It's genetically, you're inclined. You're, if, if your chromosomes or something, God is responsible for making you be attracted to the same sex. Let me tell you, this says no. This says you can change, that it's a heart issue. It's a sin issue. And it's not, maybe it's not super easy depending upon how long and involved. But this passage is wonderful because it says they were this way. They were washed. What does that mean? Does that mean they had to take a bath before they could come into the church? No. It says that you, your conscience was, was cleansed. You're no longer walking under the guilt and your identity. You are a truly new person, a new creature in Christ. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. God changes people. God gives hope to sinners. I'm excited about that. Our world, our community needs to know that. So, where sin abounded, God's grace abounded more. But I'll tell you another thing that we ought to do with that, because God is faithful even when we're discouraged. Is God can use you and me to bring the powerful, life-changing gospel of Christ to people here in our community, people you work with, live next to. And he can change them and wash them and clean them and set them in a new hope-filled life. Do you believe that? If God was able to save the corrupt Corinthians, do you think he can save anyone else anywhere else? You bet he can. Next, God, in the midst of depressed, fearful servants, God can encourage us. He's faithful. And he did this. If you look in verses 9 through 11, <clears throat> this is one of six visions that the Bible records, most of which is in this record in the book of Acts. I think all of these are in the book of Acts. Chapter 9, chapter 16, here in chapter 18, chapter 22, chapter 23, and chapter 27, all record various times in which the Lord came to Paul at a key time in his life and ministry. In this particular time, let me read these verses and see what we can glean of the situation. The Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you. For I have many people in this city. Let's, let's take this apart. First of all, <clears throat> did the Lord, did Paul actually, just was this just an impression? I often hear people say, you know, the Lord told me. And I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Mm -hmm. Did he speak in an accent? <laughs> Did he have a, you know, a Greek or a Hebrew? Or was it in English? Or uh, what did you hear? Oh, no, I don't mean that. I mean, I just, but, but be careful about that kind of terminology. If the Lord told you, the Lord now, because Paul did not have this, the, the Lord now confirms, leads through his word. I'm not saying that there's not the possibility that somebody in a rare situation, but I'm saying very much normally the Lord uses his word in leading us and in directing us and encouraging us. In this case, 
1 Corinthians hadn't been written, Romans hadn't been written. I mean, a whole bunch of this New Testament had not been written. And this is what it, the, the grace of God needed to do for Paul at this time. He was, he actually saw the Lord Jesus Christ again. The first time he saw them was when he was on the road to Damascus and the Lord said, why are you, why are you fighting me, Paul? And all of a sudden he, he realized, Jesus the Nazarene is God. And he was changed. Just like that. But... <clears throat> The first thing that the Lord confirmed for him, which is so critical, verse 10, he says, I am with you. Is Jesus still able to say this to you today, right now? Is Jesus with you? Really? Is he? I think that of all of the things that, that sustained Paul or any of the servants, even in the Old Testament, it was the knowledge that God never will forsake you. He'll never be away from you. He is with you. What did John, we talked about this on a resurrection morning, what was the significance of the Lord having stood there, the, the glorified, exalted Lord, and around him was what in that revelation vision? What Do you remember? What were the things that were all scattered around them? They were lampstands, and, and the text tells you what those were representing. And that was the Lord in the middle of his churches. You know, if we really would remember this, when I stand up to preach like this from the word, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, I've got some intelligent people in my church. I can't just treat this casually. But you know what's super more sobering to me? In this service right now is my master. He is here with us. If he wanted to materialize, he'd be sitting right next to Paloma. I don't know where he is. <laughs> I, but he's here. He's here. He can do that because he's God. So Paul was encouraged by the faithfulness of the presence of the Lord. It was his presence. Remember before Jesus left and his disciples, not just the 12, but there was a lot of them that were with him as, he, as they were leaving to go up and ascend the mountain where he would take, you know, be lifted up and disappear in the clouds. And Jesus said to them, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. That's some of the last things written in the end of the book of Matthew, Matthew 28, 20. I am with you always. Always. And to make sure you understood the word always, he said, even to the end of this time. Wow. Isaiah 43. You might want to write this one down. This is a wonderful verse, or three verses. I want to read this to you. God says through Isaiah, Do not fear. Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 3. Do not fear. For I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I'm with you. That is the ultimate comfort. If the Lord is with you, that means he cares. That means he'll sustain you. My dad claimed the promise, and I believe that he discovered that day when, he, when his spirit left his body, that he would often share with people 
when they were on their deathbed, that verse from Psalm 23, I will go even through the valley of the shadow of death. I am with you. In other words, when it comes time to die, I'll be there to take you into the next joy of your existence. The second thing that was affirmed and confirmed by our faithful God to a discouraged, fearful guy is the Lord confirmed his protection. Now, he didn't say any other time, you know, Paul, I'm, I'm going to protect you. You're never going to get a beating. Obviously, Paul got many, he suffered. He got a lot of whips and beatings and shipwrecks, and he, he had a lot of difficulty. But the Lord knew that in this particular time in Paul's life, he needed to know that he, you know, maybe he felt like, I can't take any more, Lord. You ever been there? I just can't take any more. My back is so bruised and I just can't take any more. And maybe he was catching glances from as he would walk into that house next to the synagogue. And maybe they were over there and they were beaten on their hand like this as if to say, we're going to catch you when nobody's watching. I don't know. But he was fearful. And the Lord said, ah, don't worry about that. I'm telling you right now. There, I'm going to protect you. No man is going to attack you now in Corinth and harm you. Anybody that today preaches that ser the servants of the Lord are not going to suffer persecution and opposition, that's not true. The Lord, in fact, promises that if you're going to live godly in Christ Jesus, you'll, you'll, you're going to face this kind of thing. So we're not exempt. But I'm saying that in this particular situation, God knows your limits. God knew Paul's limits. And Paul said, no, don't worry. I got you on this one. No, no harm will come to you in this situation. The third thing that God confirmed to Paul in his discouragement and his fear, he said, I have many people. You think you're done here? You're not done. I've got a lot of people here that you haven't met yet. You haven't seen the change that the gospel is going to bring to them. But I have a lot of people. And so the Bible tells us here that God let that Paul stayed on for a year and a half. It was the longest to heretofore that we know of the longest time that Paul stayed in any one of these church plant situations. And it was the hardest city. But I think that from this time onward that Paul, everywhere he went, he's going, I can't tell. There's no E on the forehead of these people saying, I'm one of the elect. Come talk to me. We don't know who they are. We're just the means by which we share the gospel. We're the ambassadors. We take the gospel. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul said, listen, this is the reason that I keep going. I endure all things for those. There are people everywhere you go that, are, that they will respond to the gospel. So that they can obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. This became a motivation and a driving force from this point on. Paul said, the Lord told me I might meet one of these people today. I might meet three of them today. I don't know. But it became an assurance for him, a confirmation. So up to this point, even when we're very discouraged and fearful, and note here that... The first thing that the Lord said to Paul there in verse 9, he said, do not be afraid any longer. What does that assure you? Paul was afraid. In this situation, when he was trying to go to sleep that night, he was shaken. He was afraid. And the Lord knew it. And the Lord said, okay, I need to give you some assurance. So he assured him of this presence protection and purpose. So here, looking back, there are four things so far. When we're down, discouraged, fearful that God in his faithfulness, look what he does. He's a faithful God. He raises up godly co-workers. He provides funds. He brings converts even in the face of difficulty and opposition. And he confirms his presence, his protection, and his purpose. He's not done with you. 
And finally, the Lord is faithful toward his servants. <clears throat> despite apathetic government and hostile enemies. In verses 12 through 17, notice. But while Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, remember the map, the whole area that the, the land bridge from over there by Athens, you cross over the narrow land bridge, and then that whole isthmus was Achaia. He was the government top government official out of Rome for that whole area. This guy, Galileo, was related to Nero. And he was the one that the Jews, when he was put into place, the Jews thought, ah, we're going to get a, a precedent. We're going to bring a case against him. And it did not work the way that they wanted. In fact, God used this effort by the Jewish leadership to establish what ended up being about a 10-year provision of security and, and safety for the, the young churches in that region because the case was lost by the Jewish accusers, the leadership. <clears throat> and it meant that they basically weren't going to find any relief bringing anything further from that guy. He sees what their questions is, and he says, nah, there's some, there's some difficulty and ambiguity. They might have been trying to say this was against Roman law, but Galileo, he saw it as being, oh, this is, this is your law, not Roman law. I'm not going to hear it. He declined to hear the case. It says he drove them away from the judgment seat. They, they were persisting, in other words. They kept trying to interrupt and argue. And finally, he just motioned to the soldiers and said, get these guys out of my court. Here's what happened. When they got ushered out, drove out of that court, they all took hold of this poor fellow, Sosthenes. He was the escape goat. He must have been, there's some, there's some difference of opinion amongst Bible teachers over exactly what happened here. But it would appear that after this guy Crispus, who had been the leader of their synagogue, when he converted to Christ, this guy Sosthenes was the one, and they began beating him in front of the judgment seat. Now, why would they beat their own new leader of the synagogue? Well, I don't know. One thing could have been like, you blew it. This was your case. We, we were dependent on you, and you, this has turned this whole thing around, and they were now going to, I don't know. But that's how much they hated the cause of Christ, is that they would, right then, I mean, there was no waiting. They, as soon as they got out of the guy's presence, they start pounding on this fella, beating him in front of the judgment seat. And, and Galileo said, ah, get these guys out of here. So... The bottom line is this. Is God faithful? What about when you are at the end of your rope? Is God faithful? What about when you have a history that brought you to the end of your rope where there's been so you can present your case. You could say, but God, this, 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 and this all happened to me. Is God still faithful? Even allowing all those things to happen, bringing you to this point. I'm here to tell you the song we sang first today. Great is thy faithfulness. Is a wonderful hymn because it is, it is the truth. It is the truth. The gospel is not... God loves you and he wants you to have a happy life. The gospel is that you are a lost sinner. You're alienated from a holy God because of your sin. And the only, the only remedy, the only solution for that sinful condition is the shed blood of Jesus, God's son. How do you get that applied to your need? How do you be made right with God? First of all, don't sidestep the fact of your sinfulness. 
Acknowledge that you are an enemy of God because of your sin. But acknowledge that Christ died for that sin. He is alone without your help, the solution to your sin problem with God. And God is faithful to save you. And if he's faithful to save you, my dear Christian friend, he is faithful to sustain you and keep you until the very, very end. In fact, he'll be faithful through all eternity. But I'll tell you this, we won't be discouraged in eternity. We'll just be enjoying the faithfulness of our God. Isn't that great? Maybe some of you came in to this room today or that room and you were <clears throat> unbeknownst to maybe the person sitting next to you or across from you. You've, you've had a hard week or you've had a hard month or maybe this has been a hard year. I'm here to tell you, God is faithful. He will not let you be tried beyond what you're able he will provide the grace. My grace, he said, is sufficient. It is sufficient for you. It often is displayed the best in our weakness, though. <sighs> what kind of a servant are you going to be? What will it take for you to say, I'm done. I'm not going to serve him anymore. I trust that you will never get to that point. And if you are thinking that before you could trust Christ with your eternal salvation, that you need to be seeing him taking care of you and making your circumstances easy right now, that's a lie. You trust him. You become one of his. You let him put you into his church, into his body, and let his spirit come in to dwell in you. And you will know provision and peace like you have never known before. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for the Lord Jesus Christ, who was there at that low point in Paul's life, just like he is there for us. Thank you for the promise of his presence, his protection, his provision. Thank you, Lord, that he is promise never ever to leave us nor forsake us and father we thank you that it is your nature to be the good wise faithful god in eternity we will never say but you you were never enough we will see things in a much clearer way when we're there lord today may you encourage your people with this truth would you let us be able to use this time of great need in this great man, the Apostle Paul, to, to see how great of a faithful God that we have who loves us and gave himself for us. Thank you, Christ, for what you've done. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's turn in our hymn books.